Welcome to Sailing God's People with your host, Dennis Beard. Talking about the cherubim of glory, and then we, uh, most of the commentaries will say these are angels, and we want to refute that. Uh, in the Word of God, there's nothing that says that the cherubim are angels. And when we look at the angels to the seven churches, it's angelos, which can also mean not just an angel in the respect of a heavenly angel, but also those that are uh, angels to the churches or messengers to the churches are the leaders in the body of Christ there for the perfecting of the saints. Now, it's true, they have to have a higher revelation to bring the body of Christ in, and it speaks of two offices there. In uh, Ephesians, Paul talks about uh, on the right hand of God that the Jesus was exalted and set at his right hand in heavenly places to usward for us. He prepared a place for us, not for himself, for us. Therefore, he has to gather all things together in one in Christ Jesus at the highest possible glory he can give us, which is at his right hand. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, is God, always has been God, and always will be God, and because we've left that revelation, and we've got him as the second person of the Godhead, we're disesteeming him, not giving him the glory of the Father, that he is and always has been that spirit, the Father of glory. He created all things, and the Father is the creator of all things, in whom is no verbalness of turning. And we see that that Father is in us. We see that in Ephesians 4. He says that there is one body, one spirit, and one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, who is above all, Father of us all and in us all. That Father's in us. When uh, Jesus humbled himself, made himself of no reputation to become a man, he did that on our behalf for our redemption, for those that are under the law. He did not do it for him to take on a lower state of glory, uh, making himself of no reputation, no glory, laying it aside. Uh, he did it all for us. It shows his love for us, mankind. He did not take on him the nature of angels. He took on him the seed of Abraham, which seed we are if we're in Christ Jesus. There, Jesus being in the form of God, that spirit. Not a not robbery to be equal with God. All the attributes of God are equal. But made of himself. That's God himself. Made himself of no reputation. That's a kenosis. Not the son of God. It's God himself. Made himself of no reputation. Laid aside his glory. It means to make of none effect. Void. It's a self-imposed limitation upon oneself. And the only reason he did that is to become one with us. Just as in Leviticus 16 on the day of uh, atonement, the high priest only would enter into the most holy place, the holiest of all. Before he did that, he would take off his garments of glory and beauty in the sanctuary, the holy place, and put on the linen garments, becoming one with the people. And he would work all uh, on the behalf of the people for the sacrifices on that day after it was completed. And he had done all the sacrifices for Israel as well as for himself. Then he came out of the most holy place and in the sanctuary, the holy place, where we have the table of shoe bread, uh, the candlestick, and the golden censer, the altar of incense, he would take off the linen garments lay him aside, never to be worn again, and put back on the, his garments of glory and beauty. After he became one with the people, he went back to that glory and beauty of the high priest. Well, uh, Jesus did the same for us. Our great apostle and high priest of the profession of our faith did the same thing for us. He made himself of no reputation to redeem us that were under the law. He came under the law as a man. Not above the law, under the law. He was one of us. Now, we see in Hebrews 2, Paul talking about it, says that uh, what is man that thou regardest him? And he made him a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor, set him over the works of thine hands. That's what God did. 
But now we see not all things under him. Why? Well, because Adam sinned. By one man's disobedience, sin came to the world, and death by sin. Therefore, by one man shall my servant make many righteous. As the offenses of one, so also the free gift is of one. Now, I know that you've heard this before on the podcast. It's in the Word of God. It's elementary. I understand that. But we have to understand these principles in order to understand the work of the ministry, which we're getting into now. The work of the ministry is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry, a Jesus ministry. Now, in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, he talks about 70 weeks of determined upon thy holy city, that in the holy city of Jerusalem, to rebuild and to restore uh, the walls, the streets, even in troublous times. It will be a time of trouble, such as never was, such was a nation, neither shall ever be again. And at that time, he said that these walls and the streets, that's the way. The streets in the city are the, is the way that we go. The street shows the way. It's a highway, the highway of holiness. And the walls are the walls of salvation. And they can't be daubed with untempered mortar, mortar that hasn't been through the fire. It has to be with tempered mortar that the wall will stand. And that's what he tells Laodicea. You say you're clothed, you're increased with goods, you have need of nothing. It's a prosperity so-called church. And we find that uh, the Lord rebukes the church of Laodicea. And he says, you're, you don't know that you're poor, wretched, naked, destitute. Then he says, I counsel of you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now, we know we're not done talking about uh, buying things with uh, corruptible things of silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So we're to buy the truth and sell it not. And that means spiritual bartering, which is by faith. Well, he counseled thee to buy me gold where it's tried in the fire. So every time that a, a believer has a revelation in faith of the thing that the Lord has revealed, it's going to be tried as by fire. And these manifold temptations, count it all a joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Why would, what would you count it a joy? Though your faith be tried as by fire, that you may come forth as pure gold for the glory of God. And that's what he tells Laodicea, I counsel of thee to buy me gold tried in the fire. The faith has to be tried. We can say we have faith, but until it's gone through the fire, then it is then in our spirit, not in the intellect, not just believing it with our mind, but it goes into our spirit then, in other words, into our bone. And there it is in the spirit of man and the intuition that faith is held after it's been through the fire. But in the last days, the Lord says, these walls that's been daubed with tempered mortar, I mean with untempered mortar, not tempered mortar, not, not the, the walls that has uh, been uh, daubed with the mortar that has not been through the fire, untempered, that it'll fall, the walls of salvation. So we're to give the more earnest heed to these things which we've heard, lest any time they should slip, and we not enter into that rest, the Hebrews 4 that Paul warns us and admonishes about, that we need to take heed to these things, the things of faith. Well, Jesus made the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So we find that in Genesis 3. As soon as there is a fall, and uh, uh, the Satan tempts uh, Adam, the woman, was not called Eve yet until after the fall, and Adam named her Eve, life giver, after the fall. But Satan tempted her and said, Hath God said? God doth know that in the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge, you will be as gods, discerning, knowing good from evil. Tree of knowledge. And it's a, an intellectual knowledge. I to the soul, not to the spirit, to the soul. And that's the reason prognosticators today, soothsayers, wizards, uh, the witches, uh, warlocks, these use uh, this ball, the eye that was opened there in the Garden of Eden. And it's the eye to the soul, not to the spirit, to the soul. You're going into things, the, 
vainly puffed up by their fleshly mind, intruding of those things which they knoweth not. And they get into angelic worship, not realizing that it's not the Spirit of God, that it is spirits, but not the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Ghost. Now, with that said, there's only one way, one truth, one life. And after that fall, he tells uh, in Genesis 3.15, the first proto-evangel, that we're going to have a Messiah. We're going to have a Savior. And at that point, the, he tells the snake, the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It's going to bruise your head and not going to bruise his heel. Not the woman's heel, her heel, but his heel. Speaking of, the woman will bring forth a man-child, Christ in the church. That's Genesis 3.15. Then he goes on down and he, and he speaks to Adam and uh, says that the fruit of thy labor and the ground there cursed thou for cause of your disobedience and bring forth thorns and thistles. Of course, Jesus wore those thorns on the cross. Uh, there the thorns sunk deep into his, in, into his scalp, uh, into his head there, taking the curse of the earth upon his head. Now, it goes there on and says that God set cherubim at the east end of the Garden of God. Now, the previous podcast, we hit mentioned that lightly about the cherubim. Now, that's a capital C, Genesis 3.24. He says, and God set cherubim at the east end of the Garden of God. East or eastward in the Word of God. And the east wind is an RMD. It's 144. It is always the work of the Holy Ghost. When the angel ascends out of the east, ascending out of the east, well, we, the body of Christ, are to be sealed in our forehead. God spoke that to me in a visitation on the 19th of January, 2019, and said, seal my people by my word. As I send the angel Ascending from the east, the angel ascending. That is going upward from the east, RMD. That is through the work of the Holy Ghost, eastward. East, eastward, always RMD in the Word of God is always uh, indicative of the Holy Ghost, the work of the Holy Ghost. And it is not by our might nor by our, our power, but God's Spirit, saith the Lord. That's the Word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Zeru, Babel, the ones that had been born in Babel, sons of Sheltiel, sons of prayer, Joshua, Jesus of salvation, Jehovah's salvation, and son of Josedek, righteousness. Now, these are the ones that we're going to find as a change of raiment in Zechariah 3. They're going to be plucked out of the fire, and that fiery trial is which is to try us. This persecution and tribulation that we might be accounted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which we also suffer. It's a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. This is the only way that faith grows exceedingly, and a charity of every one of us abounds one toward another. Now, the charity is the final step in glory on the church, this side of glory, before the second advent, when the Jesus comes the second time without sin and salvation, for the salvation of his saints. We add to our faith virtue. Virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience, godliness, the godlike. Then we add to godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, charity. Now, charity is faith toward God and obedience. It's a love for God based in doing his will. It's not just love. We can love in word and in tongue, but charity is indeed in truth. So charity is not just love in a general broad sense. It's the love for God in doing His will. at charity. And that's the final step in doing the will of God. And Paul talks that says there's about it, faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is charity. Now he talks about the characteristic and the very essence of charity in a person's life, in a believer's life. It rejoices in the truth. Vaunteth not itself, not easily puffed up, seeketh not its own. It's always lifting up Jesus. It rejoices in the truth. And then Paul says, when I was a child, in other words, not full grown, 
as a child in the body of Christ. I thought as a child, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, there are four different areas and stages of glory that we grow through in the body of Christ. And of course, you've heard this before. The first stage is that of a newborn baby. The newborn babes, their desire, then sincere milk of the word, they may grow thereby. Well, they're born of the water and the spirit. And we do that in Acts 2.38. Peter, given the keys to the kingdom, tells us how to be born again. Repent and be baptized. Not just repentance alone. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Your sins are not remitted except they're born of the water. Water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38, Acts 8.16, uh, Acts 10, Acts 19, Acts 22, all the way through, they were always baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were never baptized by the Son, Holy Ghost, because that's not the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now then, when they're born again of the water for the remission of their sins, the body, the sins of the flesh destroyed by baptism, then, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, born of the Spirit. Now these are newborn babes. They're not grown yet. They're novices. And don't use a novice, lest by being lifted up in pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. He has to have experience. He or she has to have experience in the Lord before they can be uh, put into an office that requires a burden, requires obedience. It takes time. Well, then from babies you grow. The next step there in 1 John 2, 12-14 is that of little children. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Yes, you're born again. And you've known the Father. Now you've grown. You have the revelation that Jesus is the Father of glory. He's not the second person of the Godhead. He is the Father. Those are little children. Not full grown yet, but certainly have obeyed the leading of the Holy Ghost and the revelation and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They have added to their faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge. They have that knowledge. Hosea tell us, tells us, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Well, we must have that knowledge of God, that full knowledge of full knowledge of knowing him. And that Colossians 2, 1 through 9 tells us, though the full assurance of the understanding of this mystery, the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom, in him, are hid all treasures, wisdom, and knowledge. Why would God hide it? Because it must be sought for. When a pure heart seeks for God, he'll find it. And that's what it takes. Well, then it's revealed. The treasures of God are hid and are revealed there in Christ Jesus. And in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything you want to see God, look at Jesus. He is the express image of God. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, not around him, not on the side of him, in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Jesus, whenever he had uh, uh, death, burial, and resurrection, made the way for us. Then he said, even as I overcame, where did you go, Jesus? Even as I overcame and I'm set, S-E-T, down with my Father in his throne, not beside it, in it, Revelation 3.21. Now, who's beside it? We are. Them that overcome, will he grant to sit with him in his throne? Those are the ones through obedience that will sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and behold Jesus' glory, that where he is, there we may be also. That's the right hand of God. Now, what are the cherubim. Who are these uh, uh, these creatures there that are life? These uh, zoe are living creatures, and they are mentioned in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. Now, we know the 4 and 20 seats in heaven is where we're seated together in heavenly Christ Jesus. Those are heavenly places. Those seats are for us, the body of Christ. Four and twenty elders. They're not angels, they're elders. 
that's the church that's gone to the higher glory as kings and priests unto the Lord their God. That's where they sat in heavenly places. Higher revelation than Pentecost. Four and twenty seats. And upon the seats, four and twenty elders. And then we have four beasts before the throne of God. Now the four beasts, when we take a look at that, the Zoe, they are the living creatures. And we see in Revelation 4, they are mentioned, lion, man, calf, and eagle. Revelation 5 tells us that the four and twenty elders and the four beasts sing the song of the redeemed. They're not angels. Angels are not redeemed. But these are. It's a higher level of glory for the body of Christ. And those are the only ones he's going to use in the work of the ministry. That those that have come to the perfecting of the saints and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. They will be counted worthy of the kingdom for which they suffered. They'll be the ones that not are only the called, but the chosen and the faithful in that calling, as you'll see in the book of the Revelation. So we see that God makes provision for that, not through us, but through the Lord himself. He does that in uh, uh, Genesis three twenty four. He set at the east, east end of the garden of God the cherubim. The cherubim to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, it's not just the cherubim, the cherubim and a flaming sword, which is even the flaming sword, one and the same, which is Jesus Christ. Those cherubim, we find in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, we find that these cherubim have four faces, and they have a face of a lion. And each of the four faces, each of them had four faces. So it's a myriad of faces, not just four. It's a myriad. More, and it's multiplied. And that is multiplication and multiplied glory. And we see that each of them had their four faces, and they had their four faces. And the four faces, each had the face of a lion, each had the face of a man, each had the face of an ox, and each had the face of an eagle. Lion, man, ox, and eagle. Now, that's noteworthy that the cherubim in Genesis 3.24 is capitalized. Why? Because it's divine. It's divinity. It's God. It's God manifest. And it's at the east end of the garden of God with a flaming sword turning every which way to keep the way of the tree of life. Not to keep man out, but to keep the way. The way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus Christ. So, though man fail not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. God knows all things. He's already made provision for it. So we're going to see the lion, man, ox, and eagle, cherubim, capital C, Jesus himself in his four faces. The faces are revealed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospels according to Matthew, Gospel according to Mark, Gospel according to Luke, Gospel according to John. And these four faces are revealed to us in Jesus Christ, because God is invisible. But he's shown forth his glory in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 3. Then he goes on and says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. There, the earthen vessels is still here in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That spirit of God is manifest in the body of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's a mystery of godliness. Well, God has shown forth his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. You want to see God? Look at Jesus. The glory there is manifest, but there's four faces. Not just one, there's four. The first is that of a lion. That is declared by Matthew. The gospel according to Matthew is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Then Mark proclaims him as the perfect man. Luke proclaims him as a suffering servant, the ox. And where the crib is clean, there's no increase. An increase comes by the strength of the ox. And then, of course, John. And that's the eagle, the flying eagle. Lion, man, ox, and eagle, each of the four faces revealed in the four Gospels and each showing Jesus Christ and the essence that he is God, but manifest to us, revealed to us. And the glory revealed to us 
in the face of Jesus. Now, we have to come out of that fire. The Holy Ghost is given to us, and we're baptized with the Holy Ghost, and that with fire. And he will truly purge his floor. The body of Christ has to be purged with fire. The Holy Ghost fire. And that means that after we receive the Holy Ghost, that we have to obey. For the Holy Ghost is given to them that obey him. So the lion, man, ox, and eagle, capital C, Genesis 3.24, is Jesus. He's showing us the way. He is our example. But then we follow in his footsteps. We walk as he walked. We walk in the light as he's in the light. And if we do that, we have fellowship one with another, blood flow, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now, the living creatures in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 is the same as we see in the cherubim. They're in Exodus, uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. And in that, we see that Jesus has already made the way for us. He has shown us the way in the days of his flesh as a lion, man, ox, and eagle. Each thing that he did, he did as a man, not as God, but as a man, showing us the way that through the eternal spirit we can do the same by the spirit of Christ that's in us. We'll walk as he walked. We will manifest him through us, just as Paul said in Galatians 2. For I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, the present light is not Pentecost. God has far exceeded that now, and the truth is now open to us in that door, wide and effectual is open to the body of Christ, and very few are listening. So God, so that we don't perish with the world, uses a chastening rod. Judgments. All God's ways are judgments to get our attention. And he tells the church at Laodicea, I counsel of thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What fire? Well, if we're missing the mark and we're out of the way, we're, we're serving a false god, uh, we're doing it in the name of Jesus, but it's a false god in a trinity. He's not a second person to God. He is God. He's not a part God. He is God, 100% God. He is the Father of glory. He is the Word. He is the Holy Ghost. He created all things, Colossians 1, 16 and 17. All things were made by Jesus Christ. Whether it be thrones, principalities, powers, things visible and invisible, all things were made by him, for him, and for his good pleasure. He is the Word. He is the Father. He is God. He stated it before him, Abraham was, I am. And there's no God junior. There's no second person of Godhead. Never has been. And we find that we have been duped, lied to, in these ecumenical councils that started in 325 A.D. by Constantine, come up with a trinity religion. And the forefathers, the apostles, and the apostles' doctrine never stated there was more than one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, is the greatest first commandment of all. Mark 12, 29. Not two, not three. Now, in the judgments of God, he's going to reveal what the Trinity is. Now, very few want to hear that, but it's still the truth. The ones that love the truth will receive it. The ones that don't will get mad and walk off to the destruction of their souls. And that's Revelation 16, 13. John saw it through the judgments of God. He said, I saw three unclean spirits. Now, he's seen the revelation of the mystery of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And he says in, in, in Revelation 16, 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Not lion, man, ox, and eagle. Frog. I mean croaking. I mean unclean. And these are spirits of devils working miracles. Working miracles? Well, God said he sent strong delusion because you didn't receive the love of the truth. You might be saved, but you had pleasure in unrighteousness. Righteousness is Jesus is God. Unrighteousness, you say Jesus is not God, but he's a part of God. You missed the mark. And unrighteousness is you don't give him the glory of the Father. That's the reason Mr. Babylon cannot wear the blue. 
can't wear the blue because that is confessing that Jesus Christ is the Father of glory. They're confessing as scarlet that he is the Son of God that died on the cross. They'll confess him as purple, that he's the king of kings and lord of lords. But they cannot. Babylon, Mr. Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and abomination of the earth cannot wear the blue, which is the heavenly expanse, the father. She can't wear it. You'll find scarlet. You'll find purple. You'll find all manner of stones. But you will not find the blue. Why? Because she'll never confess that Jesus is the father. And then we have the Chalcedonian def definition of the God-man. That's another lie. He's not a God-man. He's the man who is God. The God-man says, well, some of the times he worked as God. Other times he worked as a man. He was switching from God to man and back and forth. That's a lie. He worked as a man in our stead. What he did as a man, we can do. He, they, the captain of our salvation, was made perfect through sufferings. How will we be made perfect through the blood of Jesus Christ? What? Not only called to believe on Jesus, but also to suffer with him. Why would we want to suffer with him? If we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. First Peter 4, 1, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us, we're in the flesh. He's that cherubim. He is that lion, man, ox, and eagle, showing us the way, the truth, and life. The keeping the way to the, the garden, the tree of life. And that flaming sword, he's it. That sword, the word of God, that turneth every which way. That two-edged sword. Jesus is that. And he showed us the way, the truth, and the light. He made the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings. Well, he suffered for us in the flesh. First Peter 4, 1. Be ye therefore likewise minded. Be in the same mind. Why? Because he that has suffered, that's us, the body of Christ. He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. How are you going to cease from sin? Through sufferings. Crucifying the flesh with the affections and the lust. The propensity to sin is in the flesh. The law of sin and death is in the members of the flesh. It has to be crucified. That's called sanctification. Called to be saints. Called to be saints is to be sanctify yourself holy, both spirit, soul, and body. And that's only through the Holy Ghost and the leading of the Holy Ghost. So the way, the truth, and life done by the capital C, the cherubim, Jesus being the way, the truth, and life, and the lion, man, ox, and eagle was, was revealed to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now we, the body of Christ, have this, this glory that God has shown forth in the face of Jesus Christ that Jesus prayed for us in John 17. Father, in the days of his flesh. Now, he's emptied out of glory. That means he's taken on a body of flesh by his spirit being made of no reputation. He's emptied out of glory. He's laid his glory aside. He's put off his garments of glory and beauty, in other words, to become one with us. He's laid aside the glory, the spirit that he is, and all the dignity and honor and the praise and the kingdom that there. he's laid it aside to work as a man, to show us the way, the truth, and life as a man. Because a man lost it, only a man can redeem us back. That's Jesus. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who became a man. That made himself of no reputation, laid aside his glory, a self-imposed limitation upon himself because he loved us, and took on upon him, upon his spirit, the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men, found in fashion as a man. Being found in fashion of man, he humbled himself to the death, the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him. Jesus stated that same in John 2, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. No man can raise his own body up except he be God. That's exactly what he did. And he's declared to be the son of God through the spirit by the resurrection from the dead. Romans 1, uh, verse 3 and 4. He is God, manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16, there's not another God. And Isaiah 43.10, he said, Thus saith the Lord, that's the Lord Jehovah God Almighty, the invisible spirit, and my servant whom I've chosen. That's the visible man. That you may know, believe me, and understand. He wants us to know him and to understand the Godhead. 
There's not three. There's only one. That you may know and believe me and understand. Not denominations. Not bishops. Not prophets. Not apostles. These so-called. But God himself. He wants to reveal himself to you. All you have to do is seek God. He'll reveal you, himself to you. You'll know beyond any shadow of a doubt. You'll know your Savior. If you seek for him with all your heart. That you may know and believe me and understand. God said that I am he. He is that servant. He is that man. Before me, there was no God formed. God formed himself a body? Yes. In the volume of the book, it's written to me, I come to do thy will, O God, for a body that has prepared me. God prepared himself a body. Search the scriptures, and then we think we have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, not of us, of me. Only one person, one God, Jesus Christ. Well, he is that God. And when we see that, that all God's glory, he has shown forth that glory, revealed it, manifested it, unveiled it in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, we have to look at the face of Jesus with an open face. And he said that all that glory he's revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Then he tells us, but we, Paul said, have this treasure in earthen vessels. What treasure? Christ. Because all treasure of wisdom and knowledge are hid in him, Colossians 2. But it's now revealed in us. Christ is revealed in us. And he said, now we have this treasure in earth and vessels, that the excellency of the power might be of God, not of ourselves. It's through him, by him, and in him that God is revealed. And he said, the Lord is that spirit. There's what your whole revelation is. The Lord Jesus is that spirit, not a spirit, not a second person of the Godhead. He is that spirit. The man is God. He is the father. The son is the father. Yes. Just because he made himself a no reputation to redeem us that were under the law. After he did that, he went back to his former glory, the father, glorified by the father's own self. And he says, all power in heaven and earth is given to me, Jesus said. Matthew 28, 18. That did not leave the Father powerless. He's glorified by the Father's own self with the glory he had with him before the world was. Before he put that off, that glory off, and made himself of no reputation, he put it all back on. There's your bottom line that what God is removing and revealing through judgments for all of us to believe so that we will not be condemned with the world. We have more revelation now than what they had even 10, 20 years ago. Why? Because Proverbs tells us the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. We have more light than they had back then. We have no excuse. It's revealed to us now. The door is open to us, wide and effectual. John gave it to us. In Revelation 4.1, there's a door open in heaven, John said, to me, and a voice of an angel, of a trumpet, a voice of a trumpet talking with me, saying, come up hither, and I will show you things that will come to pass hereafter. The things coming to pass hereafter is the present truth in faith. Faith is the substance of things, hope, or the evidence of things not seen. It's the voice of God. I said a voice of angels, the voice of God. A voice talking with him, the voice of a trumpet. The trumpet voice of God. The feast of trumpets is the body of Christ speaking the oracles of God. They will simply be instruments of righteousness for him, for his sake. And that is what John sees to give to us things which must shortly come to pass. And signified it by his angel unto John, John giving it to us. He said, there's a door open in heaven, Revelation 4.1. And a voice of a trumpet talking with me, the voice of God, voice of a trumpet talking with me, not a cornet, flute, harp, sackbolt, psaltery, or, or dulcimer that you see in uh, Daniel 3, verse 5, 10, and 15. Those six instruments, none of them, in Babylon, with the image built, have a trumpet. They have a cornet. It's close but it doesn't have that clear clarion uh, piercing 
trumpet voice, the voice of God. It's clothed, but it won't pierce the heart. It's a cornet. It's a flute. It's a harp. It's a sackbow, soldier. It's a dulcimer. It won't pierce the heart. And we see it in, Gen- in Daniel 3, verse 5, verse 10, and verse 15. Three times it mentions these six instruments. <clears throat> they hear the current so-called church, the worldly church, hears those three different times of six instruments in Daniel 3, verse 5, 10, and 15. They hear that cornet. Flute, harp, sack, both cells, dulcimer. They hear it, but it's not the trumpet. Only the clear trumpet voice of God pierces the spirit of man. And that is what we have to hear in these last days. <clears throat> He's revealing that true voice of God now. By his word, he's given us through the Holy Ghost the revelation of who he is, that he's the only true God in eternal life. He was made perfect through suffering. The captain of our salvation as a man was made perfect through sufferings. Learned obedience through the things which he suffered, showing us the way, the truth, and life as a flesh and blood mankind. And that's what we have to do also. We have to crucify the flesh with the affections and the lust and draw near to him, then he'll draw near to us. And then... We resist the devil and he'll flee from us. That revelation of Jesus, that he is God, has been muddied by the Chalcedonian definition of 451 AD, the so-called God-man, in which 90% of the churches today hold to the God-man doctrine of Christ, which is a straight straight lie. And God, through his uh, uh, love, mercy, is through his judgments moving to move us back to and return to the true revelation of God, the true Jesus, the real Jesus. Behold the real Jesus to those that have an ear to hear. He does it through his judgments. Hosea 6 tells us, come and let us return to the Lord. We have forsaken him. We've we've hewed us out cisterns that can hold no water. Clouds where there's no rain. Uh, trees twice plucked up by the roots. We believe the Trinity doctrine where there is no such thing. Now God is moving in judgment to reveal himself to those that have an ear to hear. And those that seek God, he's going to reveal it. He said in Isaiah 43, 10, that you may know and believe me and understand I am he. I am that servant. I am that man. The man Christ Jesus is the Lord Jehovah God Almighty, the Father of glory. He said before me, there was no God for him, neither shall be after me. See now that I am God. I'm the Lord, your Savior, God, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. When you have that revelation that God works salvation in and of himself alone, you're in the doctrine of Christ because Christ is the Spirit of God who made himself a body of flesh and blood by making himself of no reputation to work as a man. Then, after his death, burial, and resurrection, through the eternal spirit, went back to his former glory. That's the doctrine of Christ. Any man have not the doctrine of Christ, he's not of his, Second John 9. And he revealed it to us in flesh. And in the days of his flesh, there was four faces that he revealed, lion, man, ox, and eagle, in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, as we, diligently seek the Lord our God, we will be changed into the same image, not something less, because we need to take a look at 2 Corinthians 3.17. The Lord is that spirit, not a second person of it, not some kind of a part of it. He is that spirit. God is a spirit. Jesus is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now in Pentecost, we saw through a glass darkly, but now there's no dark glass. God is revealing his truth, his glory, his honor, his whole face. Notice it says in 2 Corinthians 3, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord 
not things seen through a glass darkly, but seeing the actual glory, the fullness of it. We all with open face. It's open. The door's open. The glory's open. That kingdom is open to us right now, right there in this present current truth and the proceeding word of God. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image, not anything less. The same image of Jesus. From glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So those of your four living creatures, the beast before the throne of God, which is the body of Christ. They don't have four wings. <clears throat> they have. They have six wings, pardon me. Six wings are Elohim status. Elohim status, a little e, gods, judges. Six wings, two that cover their uh, eyes, two that cover their feet, two they did fly. The fly is uh, taking the doctrine of Christ and literally being expounded, proclaimed, proclamated, published through all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end will come. It's Elohim status. The wings are what we fly upon the wind of doctrine. And we have to grow up in him in all things so that we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We'll get into more detail. And the cherubim, which Paul said in Hebrews 9, 5, shattered the mercy seat, which he could not speak particularly about it at that time. Why? Because he was in a Pentecostal season. Not us. We're in that full season of God. We're in that season of perfection. We're in that season that the door is open to us. Wide and effectual. The voice of a trumpet, the voice of Jesus coming to us now, to those that have an ear to hear, and showing us things, uh, the perfect faith, the whole truth, all things, not partial truth, all truth, all things that will come to pass hereafter. And those are what the ones that he's sealing now that will have an ear to hear. So we must enter into these things. Keep turning to the podcast. There's more to come in this great truth. And it is a radical change from Pentecost. We'll, call, we'll talk about the changes of what we deem to be church as usual. We'll, we'll totally change. And the glory being much higher. It'll be the so much glory as changing from little children. Think about it. When you were a little child and you played with the... Uh, uh, the things there that little children play with. The girls play with dolls and the boys play with uh, footballs or whatever the case is. Uh, they thought as a child. It's the same that we're coming into a full growth season as men, full grown, weaned from the milk, having our senses exercised their body to deserve both good from evil. It is such a different mindset in the mind of Christ that it is such a radical change that only those that come into it will be counted worthy of it. When I was a child, Paul put it that way. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. But there's a whole lot of difference. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Another way to put that is, in Hebrews 6 verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving, didn't say forget, that leaving the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Come up to a full man. When you become a man, you put away the childish things. You become a full-grown man, winged from the milk of full age, having your senses exercised thereby to discern both good from evil. You're grown up into Jesus in all things, all truth. And at that point, Paul said, when I was a man, I put away these childish things. That's the same thing he said in, in Hebrews 6, leaving therefore the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the, the foundation of faith toward God, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, read, and doctrine of laying on the hands 
and of baptisms and of the resurrection eternal uh, life, God, uh, this will we do if God permit, of course. But he's talking about growing up into Jesus in all things all true, which is essential, critical now for the body of Christ to be counted worthy of that kingdom of which we're going into now to preach this everlasting gospel all the world for a witness in all nations. We'd like to hear from you. We write to me, Dennis Beard, Post Office Box 2906, Longview, Texas, zip code 75606. Or you can uh, uh, call me, if country code 1 plus, area code 903-746-4885. Leave a message. I'll get right back to you. It's time for the body of Christ to come together and know each other uh, there in person. The body coming together bone to bone uh, there, uh, whichever joint supplies for the edifying of itself in life. And that's how we, with the body of Christ, will stand. Standing up a great army, bone to bone. And uh, then the Lord putting the meat on the bones, the meat of the Word of God. Standing up as one man, Christ the head, we the body of the Christ. If this is uh, uh, spoken to your, uh, bore witness to your spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, with your spirit that this is the truth, well then be sure. You know, call me, write me. And of course, uh, you can also do that on the website, sealinggodspeople.org, sealinggodspeople.com, or dennisbeard.org. We also have the e-books, uh, seven books that I've authored that are on dennisbeard.org. Uh, there that you can purchase these, download them, uh, that go into this work of the ministry. Uh, that manifest sons of God in the day of the Lord. Uh, we're in the season now, tabernacle, not Pentecost. It's time for us to enter into within the day. It's for us now. A radical change. A radical change that those that, that do not get this new wine and make themselves new wineskin, saying that the old is better, will have its full and both will perish all upon the ground. It's that essential. It's that critical. Well, we want to hear from you. Thank you for your prayerful support and your generous donations whereby we're able to keep the podcast coming to you over there. Until the next time, this is Brother Dennis Beard saying, Behold the real Jesus.